Hello everybody. Welcome back to Wappleville. I'm just gonna move some things around here. We're gonna get this thing off the screen here. And you can see we've got something called the Builder Stone Thrower. This is from Song Ice and Fire, of course. We're just looking to get the chat working over here so that I can see people and stuff, see what they're wanting to say. So just give me a few seconds to do that over here. Yeah, I think that might actually work. Here, I'm going to reduce my screen a little bit. That might work. Now what I've done is actually take some of the crew off here. And that would be some of these guys right over here. So we got these two guys. They're going to go back here where I've added this little pile of rocks. And your basically your commander guy, he's going to go right over here. Also added a few other things. Added some stakes right here. And I got an example here of the scorpion bolt thrower here. So you can see again we did the stakes. We have some rocks around there. And hopefully we'll have time to do the snow and mud effects here. Because we got this going. And just to, since we had the ammo over here, I thought why not make the base is big enough. Why not make them a little bit of an ammo pile there. The other one, I'm going to actually move that maybe further back and do more with the fortifications here, if you want to call them that, the obstacles out in front. Now what we're going to use is a combination of some Reaper paints here. We got all the liners out there, gray, green, blue, everything else. We've even got some Pro Acryls out here. We'll be using some of these from Monument Games. We even have some contrast paints those are up here in the palette and maybe I might even try this I uh, had it for a while I think I used to use it back in the day figured I'll give it another shot here once again we've got the we're gonna try and do this type of effect here for your night's watch war machine I'm gonna do that on the stone thrower over here and what we're going to do is just get started here with some real quick glazes. Now I'm going to get my chat going over here, see if anybody is... Alright, so far, don't see anybody. I'm going to use a big old brush right here. It's a number 12. It's just like my green handle craft brushes. It's just a whole lot bigger. So again, we got our liner paints out here. we got some sepia liner, some brown liner. There's some gray liner, a little bit of red. What we'll do is we'll focus first on right here. We'll just get a little bit of the little bit of action here on the ground. And you can see that not really mixing the paint at all. I'm not worried about this being any kind of a precise color because as you saw, we got snow effects that are gonna go over this, mud effects, dirt, all kinds of stuff. So why why sweat the details like that? It's almost going to be done in a little bit of a watercolor style. Now I'm going to go back to my camera controls and zoom out all the way here. That's better. Yeah, and right now all I'm all I'm using right here to just water. Throw that in. It's all mostly going to be covered up in one form or another. I'll just keep working our ground colors here. Let's go back to our sepia liner. whole idea is to just have some variety here. Now maybe when we get to the stones, well maybe that's where we start to use a little more of that gray liner. Not quite there yet. I, I think what we're going to really have is, for sure, is some some of the snow sort of marched away as they keep walking back to their pile of basically their pile of ammo over here speaking of gray liner let's just shoot that in there I can even take some water in here if you're wondering what the rocks are made out of it's the same bulletin board cork that I use for basing well, I just realized this is extraordinarily early for me to start right here it's what 1230 my time reason I did that is because this could take a little while. I mean, you have, what, four crew here? 
You have the war machine itself, so we got, we got a lot to do. Well, I have a lot to do. You, not so much. You can just sort of kick back and relax. Here, I'm just going to get in here again with the sepia liner. Nothing fancy here. Ah, first, last. That is not a Thin Warrior. Uh, this may... <laughs> This might wipe out a lot of Thin Warriors. Now, of course, <laughs> uh, just looking at the card, for the average person, this will do a lot of damage. For me, who has got the unique ability to call upon maximum ones on all rolls whenever possible, uh, this probably wouldn't kill as much for me. I know, again, uh, Regular person fields this. They're probably wiping out units every turn. Me, <laughs> I could see not so much. Now, what would be very interesting is to see some kind of outflanking Thin Warriors come up on this guy. Although it actually does have some fightiness to it, which that's an official combat term. As I've, I think I coined that today. Or was that yesterday? I think it was yesterday, yeah. Fightiness, that's that's a highly technical gaming term right there. And I'm just going, this is just my gray liner all along the outer edge here just to have some fun. What we'll do is we'll, we'll let that kind of sit. Kind of move this off to the side. Now let's grab some of our crew. We've got our Commander here. We got blue liner and gray liner. We're gonna play with some of that. So let's let's zoom in on him just a touch. Again, I've got to have multiple windows open here, so just bear with me on that. And we're gonna also stay with this bigger brush. So gray liner, then blue liner. This was all primed with the usual. Badger Steinal Res. So I think I might have already mentioned. I'm not sure if it's on my screen, but the title says Thin Warriors. Um, yeah, I thought I had gotten rid of that. It should say Night's Watch. I did a title screen, but maybe it didn't do it. That's something I can change later. So we're going to do the same little magic with our sponge here just a simple makeup sponge what this does is it kind of augments that little bit of shading that we did with the primers let's do a little comparison now so you can see that gives it a little bit more shading right there yeah it really i don't know why it says uh oh okay i changed the description not the title so I will do that after this is over. Yeah, look look at the description. It'll say all about Night's Watch. I think it's been at least three weeks since I had a chance to do one of these because I was away at ReaperCon for a week. And then it took a solid week for my voice just to get where it is now. Pretty much two days ago, woke up, I was barely able to talk at all. It's a combination of allergies and just voice strain in general. Conventions are about the worst thing imaginable for my voice because all it takes is one loud talker to make all the other loud talkers talk even louder. Man, I can't compete with one of them, much less an entire convention full of them. So we got that. Back to the sponge. And I've got smaller sponges if I need. Like so. Maybe a little more precision in there. I could also cut the other ones there. I have some thin warriors. I could paint those. Then technically it would be right. Let's see, we got one sitting over here somewhere. Yeah. Boom, there we go. Thin Warrior. He's dancing around in the background. 
So now we have now we got the title matched to what we're doing, sort of. Actually, it would be interesting to paint him. Oh, what the heck? Let's do something like this here. We'll do it in the same guy or the same way here. Just this time we're gonna go more with red liner and. Throwing a touch of the sepia too. Now this is in some ways very similar to what we did with the oils and also kind of different. I think with the Thin Warriors we didn't necessarily wipe as much away with the makeup sponges as we're doing right here. You can see it's it's not something that I only do on stone throwers or war machines. It's something I do on all the figures. And all it really does is sort of accentuate that little bit of pre-shading that was done with the primers. Here. What I'm going to do is, as this guy and the other crew dry we're gonna throw some paints back out there now I mentioned we got contrast paints too here, I'll just wipe that away from the skulls there right here we got some contrast paint so there's green and purple over there and we've got snake bite leather and I think there's fire slayer flesh in there so that's got to be the Fire Slayer there. It has a little bit of red to it. That's actually mixing with some of the brown liner. And we're just gonna we'll hit this like so. And here's a little bit of the snake bite leather. And you can see right away the difference there. It has a little bit of a greenish tint to it. And I wish it was a cold because colds don't whack my voice the way allergies do. It, it's almost like an off switch for my voice. Basically, mouth opens, absolutely nothing comes out. And that makes it less helpful for recording videos. As all these preliminary washes dry, I can show you the... Oh, what was that? The Mountains Men unit and oils that I just finished. That was the first new video I was able to record when I got back. You can see here now that I'm using the you know, let's even accentuate that with a little bit of red liner. Now that I'm using the contrast paints I, I don't take the sponge and remove those in quite the same way because they, they sort of settle down into those crevices here, let's. I just got to turn this upside down just to make sure. Just to make sure I get stuff underneath there. Again, that's the Fire Slayer flesh. Just letting that work its way around, then into some snake bite leather again. It's fairly basic, fairly simple. When I go over this with some mid tones and everything else, that's where we're going to start to put in some. Some of our interesting grays and such, but I am going to get a little bit of green here. You can see it's got a greenish touch to it now. And a little bit of that Fire Slayer. Flat, I believe that's what it is. You can see even at this early stage, there's some color variety that's starting to happen. And then back to the snake bite leather, which will give us again some more of that greenishness. Because wood, especially wood that's just not freshly cut, well, that's going to have a lot of greenishness to it, really, when you think about it. So, again, back to this a little bit of a mix of the red liner and the snake bite leather. You know, some of that works its way into the ground color. That's all right. No big deal. Because at this point, all I want to do 
is just get that primer out of the way. Just get it all covered. So you can see this is its not quite the, if, if you've seen some of the other videos, and I'm, I think I'll just link those to this in the description. I don't really use the contrast paints in the prescribed way. First of all, we mix the heck out of them with a bunch of other stuff. Here, and just got to get my big old brush in there, make sure I've got all the stuff. Now we're going to take some of that purple, some of that green, I mean a little more of the green, because purple and green together make a gray. And as you can see right there on our crew, it starts to give him a little bit of a grayish feel. But where there's more purple, it's going to be different. We're even going to throw in a little bit of blue liner here. That's going to add a little more variety to it, a little more spice. But you notice we're not really trying to be careful around any kind of edges or whatever. That's not really the issue here. As I said before, this is all its just about covering primer. There's going to be some of these bits and pieces of this that you won't even be able to see. So I'm not really going to focus too hard on stuff like that. What we are going to do is we're going to take some of this here and We'll hit some of our stones with it again. You can see the variety that's already happened here on the stones. I can even go in here now and start to move some of this around. Or go in the opposite direction. And just take it away. And see how much look at how much of that we're taking away. Let's just do some, let's just do some of that. We'll do a little house cleaning here. I'm just going to take some of that away. Here's another sponge that I cut up. There we go. We'll just kind of dab this back in there, move it around. So we have plenty of variety here. We've got some greens, we've got some tans, we've got all kinds of fun stuff that's working there. Now let's check some of our our crew. Now if we want to, let's say we're going to throw some of that. Oh, where's my gray liner here? So again, it's just gray liner for Reaper miniatures. Let's throw that over here. Now we'll maybe go, we'll go in the next step brush down. Let's grab something here. So the usual craft brushes that you see me use. So gray liner, some blue liner. Here, let's get some more of the blue in there. Even take a little bit of my my contrast paint mix. Where are we at here? So I can even darken this down a touch more. Now what I did. If you saw on that other crew, there was more of the, got a little bit more of the mud effect on their cloaks. Maybe we'll do that here. But see, this is almost a little bit, speaking of thin warriors. See what we're doing here? We're starting to feather out these brush jokes. So it's not a glaze. Definitely not a glaze. Let's just darken this down a touch here. Let's get some lighter paints out on the... So here is the, the legendary Faded Ultramarine. That's from the Monument Games right there. Oh, let's, let's just pop this over in the corner here. Like so. By the way, just as always, Wet Palette brought to you by Chinese Food Container Chamois Sponge and Parchment Paper. Uh, the, the food should be tasty, hopefully, but it sure as heck shouldn't cost you a lot to have wet palette out of it. So let's get in now. You can see i got all kinds of nifty colors that I can access here. 
I might throw a, a glove on too so that my hand is not basically making the all the dark colors here seem that much darker. So here, let's work this cloak a little bit. So that seemed so light on the palette, or so dark on the palette here, it almost seems light by comparison. Alright, so I'm just going to real quick throw on a, a quick glove here. There we go. Now he shouldn't contrast quite so much. And I'm going to see if I can't make him one step bigger for you. I'm going to go back into that faded ultramarine blue. Then the idea is, it, there's no nowhere here is black. Uh, have you seen black on the palette? Nope. You've seen some blue. You've seen some gray. You've seen brown, red. You've seen lots of different colors, none of which are black. It's just not necessary. The figure is going to look black, believe me, because your eye is just going to translate the colors that way. It's going to see this. It's going to see it's really dark. It's going to see that it's not shifted too much towards brown, towards green. Actually, this might be an interesting time for the heck of it. Okay, so this is that that drying retarder right there. I got some of it in this little little watercolor thing right here. I have no idea what this is going to do. It's obviously going to thin it down. The question is, just how long of a drying time are we going to have? Is it a couple of minutes? I doubt if it's much more than just a couple of minutes as far as a dry time goes. What we're going to do so we'll keep adding that faded ultramarine in there. I don't think he's wearing a glove. I'm just going to decide that right now, that no, he's not wearing a glove. And what I'll do is on the fur up here, we'll use something different to highlight that. I think I might go with something that's more like a flesh tone because that actually makes a really interesting gray. So right now the, the drying retarder thing, all it really seems to be doing is just kind of thinning down the paints. doesn't really seem to be doing a lot for drying time or extending that. Again, we'll see. Plus, I don't want to get too far out on this guy and forget about the whole rest of the crew. So let's throw out... Oh, let's go something like this. This is bright, warm gray. So it has a little bit of a greenish tinge to it. Oh, hey, Bethany, how's it going? Yeah, sorry, this is sort of a weird time. Uh, it could be going for a while. Who knows? I might still be doing this when you get home from work. All right, let's just get some of this out here. You don't need a whole bunch of it. Now, I, I won't say have fun at work because, well, I don't really think that's very possible at all. Well, I guess for me, I mean, this this is what I do, and it's always fun. Now, I don't want this to be too light, so what I'm going to do is just... Hit some of this here, and then go back in with something darker. So this is all that stuff that was already just sitting out there. And that's going to do a little bit of blending on its own. Yeah, I think I, I had a tendency 
to really make all of the fur on these guys a lighter fur and I didn't do too much that was darker. So I'm going to try and make an effort to change that up. So you get some of that contrast stuff that's more more of a brown right there. Yeah, see how much darker that makes it. Let's get a little more work in here. And then we'll just throw some of that brown on his hair. You can see how much darker that was than the rest of the flesh tones. Let's throw a little bit of that on this belt, some on his boots. And we're also going to get a little hint of that on his cloak. So yeah, the, the drying retarder thing, I pretty much have the verdict on that is it doesn't really retard any drying. It just kind of thins it down. It's almost more like flow improver than anything else. So let's try a little bit of, again, this is sort of a maiden flesh type thing. Let's just throw a little bit of that out there. Let it mix with some of the some of the red liner. There we go. So yeah, sorry that I forgot to change the title on this thing. It's it's been a while, and it's it's been kind of a very long and crazy month and a half. Pretty much starting with Gen Con and that just continued. It never got any less crazy. It just kept getting crazier. Fortunately all that stuff is over. Next convention that I've got to deal with is October I think it's towards the end of October. What the heck is it called again? Oh, uh, Dragonfall. I'm actually teaching some classes there. That's here in the Chicago area, which definitely better for me. I do want to say to everybody that was at ReaperCon that stopped by Fort Wapple and checked out all the live demos that I was doing, just want to say thanks for that. We were painting a whole bunch of Song of Ice and Fire. And I actually got to play a game of Song of Ice and Fire. Which was a historic moment. I mean, it was unheard of. Jim actually gets to play something. So now I'm just going into his boots here. You can see there's... Nothing terribly fancy about any of this. We're actually going to take some of that Fire Slayer Flash to warm this up just a touch. Hey, Tyler, how's it going? Well, ReaperCon, I believe, last year they doubled their attendance from 500 to over 1,000. And this year they easily had 15, 1,600. And I'm sure next year if they don't have 2k they're going to come real close to that it was really nice with Fort Wapo we had the the new camera that the types that they use at Adepticon that works really really well we had tons of people that were folks there until four o'clock in the morning and thank you very much Ryan for being one of those hardy veterans that, that just stayed down there and we painted miniatures and talked about miniatures and lots of stuff. So you can see we're building up on the skin tones here real fast. I can even take some of that oh that's the maggot white over there so we can cool this down a little bit. Uh, actually geez I think uh, Kathy has, I know she has some Parabellum figures. I know she has some Conquest. Of, I think she has a one Cavalry figure. And she has some other Infantry-style figs. 
So I think she'll be painting those on her stream at some point. I'm not quite sure when. Because yeah, while we were away, oh, what the, whatever it is, the Streamlabs OBS did some crazy update and completely zonked all of her screens. So she got that worked out today. So, well, later today, she'll be doing her stream, I want to say, in 14 hours. She'll be streaming live. Uh, I guess that's a that's a new take on Carpe Diem. A little bit of season the day. We just control it all. I, I think one interesting thing about their stuff is it's a larger scale. In some ways, it's a little bit like the Song of Ice and Fire stuff. But geez, I think it's an even bigger scale than this. Not maybe. Yeah. Yeah, I, I haven't actually had a chance to really compare the two directly because I, I just opened up the Tully Cavaliers today and I still think that those horses are probably smaller than the Parabellum. I remember we saw that at Adepticon a couple of years ago. They had their big old display set up. So here we're just trying to lighten this up a little bit and you can see we've been using some of that sepia liner in there to keep it more towards the warm side instead of automatically just going cooler and cooler with it now i'm going to go back here to the cloak and speaking of a cooler color this is actually a warm cooler warm cooler warm cool color that we're using now that's the faded ultramarine it's sort of a light bluish gray but it has some red in there and that's gonna give us a little bit of contrast there now let's grab again this is the oh gosh what is that the drying retarder from reaper that we just threw in there so what we'll do is you know later on We'll grab some smaller brushes and we'll we'll do some finer details and all that. But for right now, I'm just trying to establish a color scheme right here. Also, I'm going to want to throw some greens in here. Besides, something besides just grays. So I've got another one of these and part of my basing series on my Patreon page, I'm going to do that. I also have a second one of those Scorpion bolt throwers and same plan there. Same plan is to take that, show how I cut the figures off the base, make the, the spikes there. Take you all the way through the mud effects, the snow effects, the whole thing. And what I'll do is I'll just keep going to that. That's the faded ultramarine here. I also have to keep in mind that there's going to be some snow effects on this. Now this guy here... I may I may wait till I've done some of the initial snow effects too so that I can maybe get his footprints into the into the snow. Cause I've wanted to do that whole footprint thing. It's by doing the mud effects, you really do create that possibility for getting those those kind of footprints in the snow kind of thing, or in the mud, as the case may be. So what we'll do now is we'll go back into those warmer colors. And this is the contrast paints here, so it's a lot of the snake bite leather that you see here. It's take some of that maggot white. It's essentially just an off white. Yeah, Kathy streams on Twitch. Uh, that's still under the more than dice umbrella, basically. Because, yeah, we, we say they have an umbrella now, or they are an umbrella. 
That's a little bit of the Pro Acryl, that warm, bright gray. And I'm just trying to find a few areas where I lighten this up. I'm not looking to lighten this up everywhere all at once, just a couple of places. Man, I'm for sure going to throw some glazes over the top of this too. And all we're trying to do is maybe make him a little bit more distinctive from the rest of the crew. Like so. And I don't know if I'll be able to link everything, but some of the previous contrast paint things I did, especially like the crossbow guys, where we were using those, mixing them with the regular paints instead of just, again, that GW way of just, okay, we slap them on, and that's it, and then we throw some highlights on it. We were using them a little different way than that. Just looking again to get some, some more lights here, and then we'll throw some glazes in later. What I am going to do is, for the heck of it here, I'm going to grab, oh, one of these. It's a brush that I got from Reaper here while we were out there. I have no idea what this will be like, if it's any good or not. We're about to find out. Eh. Yeah, there's already some... I think I might have to cut off an extra... Let's see. Let me see if I can get that there. And these might... These will probably be the lightest highlights I throw on the fur of the cloak right here so I don't go any lighter than this. If anything else I'm going to be throwing some shading over the top of that because if I'm going to do the snow thing I especially want to do some snow stuff on the big fur cloak over here the snow's not going to show up very much if it's too light so now we're just going to try and get some lights in the eyes here. Then what we'll do on certain parts of the face here, we're going to try and get that whole rosy nose slash cheek thing going on. So let's let's find ourselves some kind of a red here. Oh, maybe something like clear red. I'm going to put this over here. That's over by the red liner. And you can see there's a whole lot of mixing here. You look at the palette, a lot of one color mixes into another. There, that gives that a little touch of that rosiness. Let's do that on the cheeks here but not on the we don't want it to be rosy on the sides we want to actually have a little bit of redness up on the top it's just that thing that ha tends to happen to a person's skin when they're out in the, in the cold weather like that here let's do a little bit more Ah, it's more. Yeah, there we go. That's the rosiness I was wanting there. I'm going to want some here on the hands, too. I don't want to say it's it's showing the fact that the person's getting freezer burned, but it's a little bit like that. Then give them a little bit of a highlight on that nose. We have plenty of green that's around here. I can grab just about any of that. I got some gray. 
and then we can sort of give them some shadowy skin tones here what we'll do is we'll take some of this and we're gonna give them some eyes hopefully people can see that so this is gonna basically create two things at once it's gonna create eyebrows and eyelids, or at least that's the plan. Once again, right here. So instead of trying to draw in the eye, we're basically drawing around the eye. Like here. And then we'll go back into some of our lighter colors here. We're going to take almost sort of a grayish tone here. Let's see what happens. Just want to make sure that's on screen for you. There we go as we fill that in a little bit. So what that starts to do is give you some separation right in there. So now you have an eyebrow and an eyelid it's a whole heck of a lot easier doing that than it is to try and draw those both in individually. Oh, thank you very much, Blas. Here, we'll do the same thing over there. Again, it makes creating that separation between eye and eyebrow so much easier. Now let's give him some highlights on the hair here, just something lighter. And then we'll show you essentially what we started with. I'll just give him some a little more definition on the hair and we have to do the same thing for the mustache beard because it seemed like somehow uh, the few reference pictures that I've seen of just the guys in the show it seemed like somehow conveniently everybody had black hair for the Night's Watch, it's like they all dyed their hair black. Now I've been trying to give them some different color here. You know, let's just get a little more of the gray work in there. And this is basically where we were not long ago comparing him to everybody else so once again if my my voice gets a little wonky or something like that I, I apologize in advance here we're gonna change up that leather a little bit it's essentially not all that much different than, say, what I would have used for skin tone. On his belt here. So yeah, this, this brush right here, it's just kind of eh. I mean, it's, I don't believe it costs as much as, what would you say, what, Windsor Newton or whatever. I can always just grab one of my Windsor Newtons if need be here. Just trying to get a little bit of this red into the hair. Maybe even a few hints of red into the fur. And by red, it's really more of a really dark skin tone. So 
So I'm going to go back to that. That's that faded ultramarine blue. And I might do some dark glazes there too. Let's get a few more lights in some of these places, some of these areas here. So uh, this is basically going to be the faded blue, and we'll mix it with a little bit of that warm, bright gray. We'll give ourselves some more, just a couple of more lights here on the cloak. There we are. On the pans, i got to shift that again. We don't want too much of just the faded ultramarine. So here's going to be a little bit of a warmer highlight color, a warmer gray. Let's get a touch of that right in here. Let's see if we can't get another highlight in here on that. I assume it's a hood of some kind. Like I said, it's really easy to find yourself going too bright, too fast. It, it can be tough to kind of keep a handle on that. So here's the blue liner. I'm going to, oh heck, I'm just using some of that drying retarder just, as a, just to thin it down. I want to get some separation here. do even more of a glaze there. Sometimes you, you see there's just not enough value somewhere and sometimes you just gotta go be bold and just get right in there and, and whack it. Just really give it some give it a shot of dark. And all that was that's just straight up blue liner. Now I can take a little bit of that grayish-purple contrast mix there. Hey there, Jack. How's it going? Uh, actually, there was... Well, you've seen them before, but only with just hand-printed labels. So now there's officially things like clear orange and the thalo blue and the thalo green. So you'll be seeing those. Probably not on this one, I would say. Yeah, maybe the next Dark Sword figure. Actually, what I did get, which is really interesting, is the... I've got the... Oh, it's vellum. Leaves, butterflies, lily pads, vines, all kinds of real nifty stuff. You're going to be seeing a lot of that. All right, so I'm going to take the snake bite leather now. I'm going to mix this up with some of our darker contrast mix. There's even a little bit of the red. Let's lighten this up a little more here. And I want to do some... Just some darker glazes in here. Yeah, since Fort Wapple is outside the main hall, we don't really... We don't get to see much of what's going on there. I know Kathy and I, we did manage to, so Kathy for, I think it was in Painters, for her little uh, stuffed animal unicorn there, she got a gold for that. I got a gold in Painters for actually a whole Wild West Exodus figure. Then there was a silver in Ordnance for the Gabbiano class. 
and there was a gold for a really old 75 millimeter figure that I had to do some repairs and conversions on. So again, just doing some glazes here. Nothing terribly fancy. And this is essentially some contrast paint mixed with some of the Reaper clear and liner paints. So that gives me a little more separation and some of the fur there. Oh, let's see if I can do something with the eyes with this brush. So I got this upside down here just so I can see it. So there's one eye. Let's see if we can do the other one. So now he's got himself some eyes. Now let's get that more defined. I'm going to go back into here, restore maybe some lighter areas to the belt here. Again, just looking to get some variety here, maybe even a little bit of this reddish brown on the boots. So it still mostly translates as, well, sort of black. So yeah, that, that drying retarder thing doesn't really retard any drying whatsoever. It does sort of act as a, like I said, more of a flow improver, if anything else. Wasn't really going to rely on that to keep anything wet. If I want to keep things wet, that's what oils are for. Alright, so we're going to set him aside here. And let's get into our some of the other crew. So we'll go back to that to the gray liner here. And we're gonna do much the same thing to these guys that we did with your commander there. Almost doing a little bit of an oil painting type thing. Here, let's get some of that blue liner mixed in. And we're just looking to get in our darkest darks, just like we did with the other guy. I can even wipe some of that away. The other thing, too, is if I can get a little bit of wet paint out here, it lets me do a little bit of wet blending. So here is the return of the faded ultramarine blue. So see right there we're able to actually do right here, look at that, a little bit of wet blending. Same thing over here. Sometimes if you wanted to be able to do wet blending, you got to have some wet paint out there. Obviously the difference between this and oils is that that wet paint's not going to last very long. Hey Al, how's it going? I like the, the contrast paints. Uh, well, there's going to be some, some links to other contrast paint videos. You can see those. I mean, to me, there's so many other things that does the, the same stuff for way less cost. Uh, what the Green Stuff World Intensity Inks because I've done some videos with those to basically compare them to the contrast paints. I already was mixing things like the contrast paints with regular paints before. If they were much cheaper, then, then I'd say they're okay. But I noticed that I was not using them very much at least not compared to what you're supposed to do with them and boy 
those containers emptied out real fast. And I noticed that there was other paints where I could use them and use them and use them. And it took a while for that jar to reach that point where, wow, there's not much in here. The I got Chimera colors on the way. I can't tell you when they were going to be here because I don't have a tracking number on it. But they're, they're en route. We'll say that. And also some Chimera miniatures too, which has me even more excited. I had a chance to try them real quick at Gen Con. And to me, they are... It's another form of the clear paints. Uh, they just have a real similarity to those. Colors that have a whole bunch of pigment in them. I, I guess the difference is... I think you have, what, 18 of the Chimera colors. Now, I think one of them is like a medium or something like that, and one of them is almost a white. So in some ways, there's more there's more of a color variety than in the clears. But then I count the liner paints as clears, too. So you can see, we just started to build up this. Now that's, oh, speaking of the Chimera paint, they do tend to stay wet a little bit longer and the one thing I noticed is that I was able to eh, maybe play around with a little more wet blending with those than say usually I could so there's more of that that faded ultramarine 13 plus the one uh, satin finish that's what it is I don't know if I used that one at all it was a very brief test. It was, I was actually on a Song of Ice and Fire miniature. I think it was Hodor. Yeah, it was Hodor and Bran. What that let me do was actually almost paint more of a watercolor style, which is, that was fun. So you can see it doesn't have to take, you have to get too involved here as you're doing your shading using the bigger brush I'll be using the same brush just like this with the chimeras I said I could actually I'm almost uh, I don't want to say almost I said I'm actually really more excited about getting the chimera miniatures because I've always thought those were really nifty and I've only I've only actually had a chance to even assemble one of them so far myself. And I do believe they've got a, a bunch more on the way. I believe the one they sent to me was a new sculpt. That's something I'll do for the for the patrons. But I'll be doing plenty of YouTube lives. I'll be using the Chimera paints for sure with, well, stuff like Song of Ice and Fire. So I'm going to go a little bit more now with the Faded Ultramate. And then i got to remember, just like I did on that Commander figure, to step back from that and use some, some warmer colors too. Like that Flesh Tone, maybe even a spot of green here and there. Let's just keep this line moving here. So there is still one more crew after these two guys. And also, too, I want to be able to show people what the Mountains Men and Oils looked like. I just posted that video to the Patreon page. I was part of my Army Painter series. I'm actually going to be starting episode or series 13 now. That's going to be some Necrons. That's going to be real interesting for me because it's going to be true metallic metals. So we're using metallic paints. And we're also going to be doing object source lighting. 
because I don't think I've ever seen anybody do a tutorial or actually anybody try to paint object source lighting on top of metallics. There's a lot of obvious reasons why that's a difficult thing to do. That's why these guys have sort of a monochrome look. I'm going to actually use a touch of that. Oh, what is that? The warm light green. To just get a few or warm light gray, which has a greenish tinge to it. I also have to make sure that I keep any kind of highlights that I have. I want to keep those lighter ones on the top sections here, not down towards the bottom. Besides, there's probably going to be some sort of mud and snow effect on their legs here, so I don't really... If I get those colors too light, that just doesn't show up quite as much. So yeah, just basically two guys hauling a rock. Now let's switch over here. Uh, let's go poof like that. So you can see right away that that gray is a different color there. There's a little bit of reddishness to it, and that's what we're looking for for down here. To just shift that away from, we don't want it to be all that bluish purple. But also got to keep in mind there will be some glazes here too. Just like we did on the commander figure. Well, and it, it's interesting because it can go from what looks like too dark to too light in a hurry. So we just grabbed a little more of our dark and brought that back in. I just need to get more, speaking of lights, need to get a little more light on this, on the rock here. It's looking a little bit too just black. And we're... I'm just going to throw a little bit of this onto the, the skin areas here. It's basically a much more gray version of what we'll be eventually doing on their skin. And I, I talk about reflected light all the time. Reflected light just it takes different forms. When you're doing the metallic stuff, obviously that's... I think that's where most people think of reflected light, or I, I suppose maybe even object source lighting. But there is reflected light on, on clothes and cloth, more absorbent surfaces, and even when it's black, even when it's black cloth, I mean, black sweatshirts, I have a ton of those, and there's always colors being reflected on there. I think he's got some sort of a knife or something there going on. I'm going to grab some of this brownish type color here and just real quick hit a few of these areas. In some ways it's almost more like a mud color. even get a little bit of almost a dark skin tone work in there. So again, we're comparing them to, you can see on our leader right here, oh wait, uh, uh, Tyler, the extra life, oh, yeah. Is that real? Well, actually, if you can just say in the chat here, because it's getting late for me, and if you can just tell me what to say in the chat, I can then say it and spread the news. Because I'm a little bit distracted right here, trying to get this thing painted. There we 
go. Now let's go in here with a little bit of a lighter skin tone, maybe even hit a little bit of the red into that. And that really gets some separation there from things like the hair and the robes and such. I think both of these guys have their beards. Seems like that's the other fashion statement that everybody's got. Everybody has a beard. Oh, and I'm going to say they're not wearing gloves. Like so. Yeah, I'm hoping that now that we're we're back for at least a little while here. October and early November, late October, early November, I get really crazy with conventions again. So I'm going to try and do more of the live sessions here over the next several weeks. Here, let's get a little bit of that maiden, or not maiden flesh, that's the maggot white. Let's get some lights here on the faces and the hands. Yeah, I don't want to get too adventurous with any highlights on the clothes here for a while. Probably not until I get the skin and stuff done. Ah, okay, so on this Saturday, you're going to be having a Extra Life 12-hour board gaming marathon at Rady Children's Hospital in San Diego. So thanks for, yeah, I, there was about a 0% chance I was going to be able to remember all that. So thanks for shooting me that info so we could just relay that to people. So if you're in San Diego this Saturday, you can check that out. Yeah, I think I'm just looking at these guys. Obviously, this these are not they're one piece. I had to cut these off of the the base of the actual war machine setup there. But clearly, obviously, you got parts that are glued glued together here still. So what I'm gonna do is go in with some of these darker colors again. Maybe do a little bit of glazing with that in some of these areas here. So it's almost sort of a bluish green glaze there. I can wipe away some of the excess. So we need things to be darker. They can be darker. Like that sleeve. Let's get it up. And here we can make that whole thing a little bit darker, take some of it away. And same thing on this sleeve here. Over here. And you have to with, and I say this all the time, you have to be kind of willing to let things, well, basically look like a mess for a while. And then all of a sudden, everything really starts to tie in together. Because you're not taking one small isolated part of it and painting it till it's done. You're basically working on all of it at once. Yeah, I know for some people that's a little jarring at first because they're used to just working on one small area. Problem with doing that is that you you sort of get locked in. 
you get tunnel vision. Here, let's get uh, some darks on that beard there. You start to get the old tunnel vision working, and you lose sight of the the whole picture. It just that can happen. You don't have anything. You don't have any context to compare it to. And things just start to get a little bit lost. So here you can see there is, now we can see that you got some of the almost reddish type colors in some of those shadow areas. But you, you go in first, you block things in. And you start to go after things like details later. That just you have to be sort of disciplined to be able to do that. Just looking to get a, some eyes here. Yeah, it's a little bit tough to reach into some of these areas and and show you all that stuff on camera oh and Tyler's gonna be teaching an intro into a miniature painting class judging a speed painting contest so you're gonna have some Gundam going on some D&D &D. so that's gonna be quite the activity there in San Diego All right, we're going to do the same thing like we did with the other commander figure. we got to get some of that, a little bit of the rosy color there in, in certain parts of the face. And the same thing on the hands. It's not really going to show up all that much right now on the screen. But believe me, it's there. And then we'll do the same thing. We did on the commander figure with the eyes. Where we're basically creating the eyebrow and eyelid all at once. This is some of that leftover contrast paint that's been sitting around. You can see we can go back in and firm up some more shadows that way too. It's the same thing that we did here with his eyes. I can go back in here again and start to solidify some more darks. Just had to get away from this guy for a little bit. Oh, yeah, no problem. I, let's see, what the heck is today? Tuesday. I don't know if I'll be able to do maybe Thursday would be the only other live session this week because I believe we'll be well it depends if we're if we're back home on Saturday I can do another live session then too but the the plan was to actually be able to go do some song of ice and fire over the weekend hopefully that happens And actually, like I said before, I'm really looking forward to trying out the new Mountains Men unit that just got finished yesterday. So we just uh, kind of reestablish some darks on him. So here is the unit. And again, this is all painted in oils. That was a lot of fun. That was really a lot of fun. So again, this is 
the latest army painting series we did the whole thing with the weathering powders the leaves on top of the scopy basing so I really enjoyed that a lot oh, and and hopefully they do their job when they are used this weekend in that proposed game or games it would actually be nice to be able to play more than one of those So yeah, let, let's see if we can't get some lighter areas on the rock here here we're just gonna do a little bit of sort of near wet blending there a little bit of reflected light maybe from some snow that might be on the ground and I don't want to get too too light with anything on the boots or whatever because I I really do want to see if I can't get some oh, just a little bit more of the mud effects going there so this is some of that snake bite leather that's the contrast paint mixed it with some regular paint like you do I don't want both of these guys to have brown here but I certainly don't want it to just be that same old grayish black let's see if we can't throw a little bit of red liner into that and give him some hair that's darker but a little bit more of a reddish brown look that's more like it get that into the beard there too at least I think he has a beard if not we'll just go more five o'clock shadow with that I'm tempted to actually break away from these two guys and maybe hit that third loader. Yeah, it looks like it looks like he's actually loading. To me, what's tantamount to grape shot because it's not one stone; it's actually a whole bunch of smaller stones in there, and to me, that just reads as basically grape shot. more of a Civil War type of thing there here I can see I just got to get some more just like needed to get some more paint down in the shoe area there now let's go with that's a fire slayer flash let's get some of the snake bite leather in there too get a little bit more just some kind of alternate color on the straps there belts or whatever we've got going on with these guys and some snake bite leather here now we got a little bit more of a gold color that's better because you'll be seeing some of this on the war machine itself Let's get some of this on the hair. So again, I hope you guys can can see this here. I know I'm moving pretty fast here. But we kind of have to. Because I definitely want to try and get to all of the different aspects of the, the basing there. Let me get to painting a little bit of the, the wood on that and such. Yeah, let's get this a touch lighter now. So 
Like I said, most of this, what we started out with was the Reaper liner paints. We mixed in, as you, even like what we're doing right now, mixing in some contrast paints once in a while. So what I'm going to do is set them off to the side here. Now I'm going to go to the war machine itself. And we've got a guy here that needs some paint. So we're going to do that. we got that same gray liner. And we'll essentially kind of prime the surface a bit here so that we can go wet into wet on him. See, I'm even going to let a little bit of that gray get into some parts of my war machine there while I've got it on some of the rocks here. And then we'll start to mix in some of the faded ultramarine blue. Like so. It's the exact same thing we've been doing with the other crew. You can see that the number eight round craft brush, it holds a whole lot of pigment, so we don't have to keep going back to the palette all the time. Lots of upside to that. <clears throat> Again, sorry, my voice is definitely... I may need to take a drink of water here soon or something like that because it is still in the process of recovering from ReaperCon. I can get a little bit... I think we can just go a little lighter there. So yeah, if you're seeing this after the fact, you're going to see a different title on it than what's on here now. Because somehow I thought I had changed it from Thin Warriors. Well, I changed the description. I forgot there's a title. I don't get to do these as often as I would like. But you can see, even though it's a big old brush... You've got a fairly sharp point on these things, especially when they are, well, more pristine right out of the container, which conveniently has a dozen of them. And just like with all the other ones, I have to kind of keep in mind, all right, let's not get too crazy with shading in one place. Now, for one thing, it stops being black and just becomes more of a purplish gray. There's that. And I know it's a, not the easiest thing to keep track of here, all of these different guys. We're, we're switching from one to the next. But this is the last of the crew at least the uh, last of the crew that hasn't been worked on yet, at least since those initial glazes. Like I said, we're going to throw some other glazes onto these things too. Now let's... Like I said, always shifting color here a little bit. Let's shift away from all of that purple gray and now something that's got a little more of a reddish tinge to it.
and it's also conveniently going to let me do some quick little skin tone on the hands and the face. And guess what? We're going to put some of this on the War Machine 2. Because, well, one, one thing we haven't said yet is if a color goes somewhere, it must go everywhere. I actually had that in sticker form all set to take the Reprocon. Somehow, the, all of my stickers ended up here at the house and not down in Texas with me. So that was kind of a bummer. Now here we're going back to that snake bite leather again. And we are get a little bit of that on our base. Now we're going to take some of this, make a little bit of a lighter snake bite leather, and the snake bite leather combo with this. It's nice because it does keep it more of a greenish color as opposed to getting zebra. We're going to take some of that. The same stuff we're using to highlight the our crew. And we're going to use that on the actual stone thrower itself. And we're going to go back and forth. We're going to darken some areas, lighten some areas. These are actual just little bits of tree branch and twigs. Has shaved down a little bit. And once I get this spread around a little bit here, I can show you the scorpion. And show you how that all sort of played out on that. So let's grab that. Here it is. So that's, we see we got some nice ice effects on there. Oh, hey, Andy. Oh, thank you very much. Oh, yeah, it was said that, well, once once I painted him the, uh, the alternate mountain sculpt there, it became less of the mountain that runs and more of the mountain that... Uh, the mountain that destroys stuff, the mountain that stays. Now, I, I think his last battle report had, oh, he tried doing the all cav list. That's right, it was all, all Knights of Castlery Rock. And I can't quite do that because I only have one unit of them so far. I might, actually, now that I've well, I'm starting to compile some of the Tully Cavaliers. Hopefully we can do some kind of a, maybe all Tully Cav list or something like that. Maybe Outriders and Heavy Cav. I think I've gotten myself caught, caught up on his battle reports now. I know for a while I'd, while we were away at Reprocon, I think I might have had to catch up on a couple. All right, let's. We're just gonna go like this and start to feel out a few lighter highlights along the way here. We're certainly gonna go back in and do some more stuff with this. Oh yeah, with the sparrow now. The, the list that I had that, that Jim and I were messing around with at ReaperCon because I didn't have the Mountains Men. Well, they were still back here at the house because, well, I was in the middle of doing all the painting videos, so I didn't have them. All I had was the, the dog, the girls, the Bastards girls. Oh, what was that? The, the Halberds with... Tywin stuck in there. Then there was, I think, Preston Greenfield and the Crossbowmen. 
and I was Boris Blount or something like that, but that was the army of Nope. I think there was one turn where all of the combat units, and even the NCUs, and the unit attachments were all shut down for one turn. Just through a whole bunch of cards and everything else. Not well. Let's see. Now I've, I know I've got the the Army Painter series that I did on the Night's Watch. Oh gosh, what the heck are they? The the Ranger trackers, not the hunters. No, I think they're the Ranger hunters, the guys with the bows. But I've got a live session. It's not all that long ago. Uh, I did some of the Dark Sword Night's Watch. And actually, I was, I think I was still messing around with the contrast paint at the time. Yeah, I think so. So uh, just check that one out. That's only, oh gosh, uh, sometime in July or August I did that one. And I think I was doing four or five. I also have another live session where I was painting. The, oh, it was the Heroes Box 1 or 2. That yeah, was the new hero box for, for Night's Watch. So that's actually on a YouTube Live. So you should check that one out. You can see this starts to, things start to get a little bit lighter, take a little more shape on. Here, let's go back into this. The old faded Ultramarine again. And you can see the highlights that looked so bright there. Well, they don't look so bright anymore. And the crazy thing is, is that this is nowhere near white. Yeah, there was a four or five Dark Sword, Song of Ice and Fire miniature. Well, basically Game of Thrones miniatures, and they were all Night's Watch. And then for sure I was doing the the most recent Night's Watch Heroes box. So here we're going to try and get into maybe a little bit of metal colors too. Let's get a little bit of reflected light there. Start to get a little bit of light on it. Chains and, and this. It's not quite like the scorpion. The scorpion had all kinds of areas of metal strapping, holding, holding parts of it together. This seems to have a whole lot less of that. I don't know. It's kind of hard to, to say which would be exerting more stress on things. Would it be the stone thrower? Or the scorpion. Alright, before I forget, let's get a little bit of some kind of a reddish color here on this belt and pouch. Just something to make things a little bit different. We'll go into here with that, that gray liner. Again, it's going to seem light right there, but it's, well, if you could see it. I've been, I've been, well, yeah, I've been looking at it, and obviously I know what the points value are, and I really can't say what that points value is. We've seen the one side of the card. I guess the, <laughs> this is a person that, is not a huge fan of the whole gun line thing because that goes back to a oh well, this is when I was still Warhammer before Age of Sigmar I was playing Tomb Kings and we were <laughs> supposed to be a two and a half hour round in 18 minutes a dwarf gun line shot away the entire army I didn't I didn't quit nothing ran because well Tomb Kings don't run but they just got shot away by a massive gun line army. And 18 minutes later, I had nothing on the table. 
and that ever since then the whole stand back and shoot type armies really <laughs> let's just say they're not my favorite in the world so I'm really hoping that is not the direction that we're going with Night's Watch now of course there's always I guess scenarios where something like that is not very, very helpful all I can figure is that when you place objectives you make sure that there's no way that thing can't be within long range of you so that it can't shoot at you while you're sitting on an objective because that's that's the problem that I can see with this is that well you have to sit on objectives to score points but here's the thing that can wipe out I may not wipe out the entire unit in one go but it can certainly weaken them enough so that something else can come along and complete the task I right, yeah, we'll we'll see Yeah, was well the Imperial Guard too, I know they sort of trended towards the gun lines also. But then that was that was kind of the th only thing they really did well. With with Night's Watch you also have Well, there's kinda not anything that they don't do really well. They their morale, the movement there's just a whole bunch of things that they they do pretty well I'll be curious to see well speaking of Thin Warriors the incorrect title that I currently have on this what happens with free folk in these guys now yeah something like I guess maybe a Harma list is good because it can get you maybe in the face of something like a stone thrower much faster but that that starts to generate another pet peeve of mine because well it even goes back to the tomb kings where they'd say well if you just did the kalita all archer list or whatever that was then you wouldn't be getting shot off the table that that's another reason why I stopped playing uh, I think Flames of War at one point because well you have to make your list a certain way to be able to play and that kind of takes away the whole point of actually doing it in the first place if you've got to write a certain list just to be able to last more than 20 minutes in a game now these things in the, the correct scenario if you're doing more of a siege type of a thing well uh, that's a whole different deal now I'm gonna take a little bit of that fire slayer flash to make myself a little bit more of a skin color here for this fourth crew member Yeah, I guess I'm, I'm obviously painting up an entire Night's Watch army. I've already got, uh, well, let's see. I think, well, after this I'll have, I got between the wolves and I got a bunch of the NCUs and the unit attachments painted. I think, though, the first battle reports that you see me do is going to be free folk in Lannister just closer to having a playable army with both of those with the Starks I also want to try and do a little more with metallics on those I want to do some TMM on those guys just so that just so it's something different so you can see what we're doing here now we're starting to starting to work in some of these lighter colors 
let's see if we can't do some stuff with our reds. Now you're going to have to uh, forgive me here. I do. I can see I'm getting a little bit of throat stuff going on. So I'm going to grab myself a cough drop here real quick. Apologize for any weird sounds that might make. But let's get some metals going here. And because it's got some of the contrast paint in there, gives it a little bit of transparency. Now we're going to lighten this up in a few areas here. Maybe you can even do a little bit of wet into wet blending there. So let's see, so it's 2.15 now. We actually, we haven't even hit two hour mark yet. That's not too shabby. Now we've worked on we've worked on all four crew. We've been painting a good portion of the war machine. Cause I was I was hoping that I could actually get you all of the, well, at least not, if not all of the snow effects, most of the snow effects. Still in this same episode, it'll be a long one. <laughs> this is not going to be a short episode. And I know people will say, well, I can't watch all that at once. Well, same goes for me. I certainly don't watch battle reports all at once. I usually have to take three, four sessions to watch a, a battle report. So we're just doing a little bit of a glaze over this here real quick. To darken some things down. can even go in here with my finger, take some of that away. Speaking of glazing, we're going to do some of that. See, we got that nice greenish gray there. We're going to take some of that we're going to put that into our war machine here into some of the wood here on the wheels let's get a little separation now from our our rope there Let's see, what do I have? I think I've got a, at least one unit of the Sworn Brothers that's, that's all set for painting. It's all based, primed, ready to go. I've got the, well, it's either Ranger Trekkers or Ranger Hunters, whatever the cav is. That's all based and ready to go. Probably paint those on some YouTube Lives. Actually, I've got, oh gosh, what are the other, the, the conscripts? I think I have at least, actually, I've already painted a couple of those. See, now you can start to see a little bit of difference. And what we're also going to do now is we're gonna grab some of this green right here. Because we've got lots of tans and everything else. It's time to get some different colors in here. Yeah, Ranger Trackers, I thought so. Want to get some green into here. And just keeping in mind that there is a decent amount of... That's the contrast green. I think it's is it the warp, warp lightning green. You can even get some of that onto our stakes there. Another reason I want to make sure to get some 
green on the wood here is, well, since it's going to be sitting in snow and other things like that, I want to have some of that snow reflect. So here again, it's just nice to have some of that green in there. Let's also get a little bit of green on him. It's also going to be a nice little contrast to the some of the string that has a little more of a more of a warmish yellow to it. But just feel free to work back and forth. It doesn't always have to be each layer is lighter or each layer has to be. You know, every glaze has to be a darker glaze. It's not always the case. Like here, so I keep making, making this a little bit lighter. But it's got a greenish yellow to it. Let's make sure we get a little bit of difference up there, too. Just constantly have to be willing to work back and forth here. Let's get a little of this onto that belt there. I can go even a little bit lighter with this. At the hack, it can even go onto some of the metal there. And th this is set up by some of those darker glazes that we did. You can see some of those glazes are still wet at this point. Now I still have my blue liner here, and what I can do now is actually maybe darken up some of these metals a little bit, and then go in and do some lights. It's just not being afraid to essentially work darker, then go back, work lighter. Hopefully this is still all on screen. I can't quite tell right now. Just from where am I? Okay, it seems to still be on screen. Oh geez, yeah, I'll be painting those guys because my favorite thing about the Song of Ice and Fire Range, I, I like all the figures, but the, the cavalry really are my favorite because it just seems like with most miniature lines, oh, horses are more sculpted as dogs in cosplay. So it's nice to have just actual, genuine cavalry. Horses that actually have veins on the muscles, that sort of thing. Here, I'm going to take some of that, some of that drying retarder, which doesn't really seem to retard the drying at all, but it does seem to make a nice flow improver. Just trying to, that's that same notion of working back and forth with the lights and the darks. Going to try and steal a few lighter colors here on this crew member. Back onto the war machine itself, maybe even drop in a few bluish gray lights. And we got some more metal bits here that need to be a little bit more clarified. Same thing on this side. Out the skin. Actually, I've got tons of tutorials on skin tones. Now there's some that are specifically oriented towards that. But pretty much any miniature I do turns into a skin tone demonstration. Heck, even this one already has. There's there's lots of little 
reference type things that you can find that sort of tell you, okay, this part of the face doesn't matter whether it's male or female, just you tend to have more veins closer to the surface, so it tends to trend more towards this kind of rosy red. There's also other parts of the face that just are naturally more gray or green. Yeah, finding references can never hurt. Although I have found you can't let those paralyze you because sometimes you find a reference and you say, well, that's what it says. It has to be like that. But it doesn't really jive with what you're trying to do with the miniature. I've had that happen. I kind of hate when that happens. So now here's something much lighter. But we're just trying to really... See, this is where I make that stone look a little bit different. Give it a little bit of almost like a sparkle. Oh, I have no idea when anything releases. Heck, I didn't even know that poor fellows were already out until somebody posted pictures online of them in a store. I have absolutely, I, I wish I knew, I wish I had a better idea when things were going to be released. It would make it easier for me to plan out these videos. Heck, even when I have things, well, like, <laughs> let, let's just say I've had some things long before the things and not the things that were being released. So I actually didn't think, I thought these were being released before things like Tully Kev and Poor Fellows. So I think it's that's all just going to be perpetually a mystery as to what's going to come out next. Now I know this is not necessarily the most thrilling exercise in the world, painting all these different metal colors and such, but this really is the way things mostly are, is just different forms of brown and gray, whether it's steampunk, wild west, historicals. You don't often get a chance, well I guess that's why I like the Lannisters so much, because it does give me that one chance to actually do some brighter colored stuff. Let's see if we can't throw just a couple of more highlights there. You can see the green over there. Let's see if we can't get a little bit of an edge light on this. Just along here. Let it creep along. Tempted to also do a little bit of rust on this since it is it's basically iron and that just has a tendency to really oxidize in a hurry but what I am gonna do right now is go another step lighter on some of the stakes here Keep it in mind, if I get too light with these things, then whatever snow goes on there is just not really going to register as snow. Here, let's see if we can't get a nice, ah, look at something like this. I mean, heck, that's almost going to look purple compared to some of the stuff we've got in here. Let's see, a favorite mini... In the Song of Ice and Fire line, well, I kind of like the High Seneschal figure. He is a really nifty one. I'm trying to think. There was one that I really did enjoy. Actually, the Baratheons, they're, they're a really different color of metal right now. Actually, the, color, uh, the figure that I want to paint, that I just, of all things... Me, the guy that has almost two armies worth of Lannisters painted, I don't have any, haven't had a chance to paint Jamie Lannister yet. 
I think I, I did enjoy the the King's Guard with all that white. That was kind of fun. But I've got a few few of the Jamie Lannister figures that I'm painting up. I guess I really did enjoy the mountain that rides. But single figure wise, it might be the alternate Gregor Clegane sculpt. You've seen that on some of Ben's battle reports. So see that's that see we got almost got like a red and green here. Well what do red and green make? Brown. Let's see if we can't go even a little crazier. So there's some this is much more of a red here. Let's go a little touch of the that's the snake bite leather. That's some of the contrast paint. I'm gonna actually go a little more snake bite leather in there. And all I want to do here is just trying to create a little bit of contrast between the the ropes here. Some of the some contrast between the ropes and the wood. I'm trying to do the same thing here. So I can even wipe some of that away. So we have plenty of I don't want to say dead wood color. Let's see how that gives that a little more a little more life to it. And same thing there, but I, I don't want to go too crazy with this. It can become too much in a hurry. I also wanted some of that here. And it's because there's a lot of the contrast paints in there. It's semi-translucent. That was a big part of that whole exercise, especially in July. Where I did all of those all those different units with the contrast paints, with the Lannister crossbows. Oh, what was it? The Free Folk Cave Dwellers, I think. Yeah, the Cave Dwellers Savages. So here, what I am going to do is, this is almost sort of a rust color right here, especially maybe a little more of the Fire Slayer Flash. I know I did one of my Cruel Seas painting exercises where we took the contrast paints and used it as basically a weathering type of a thing. So we're doing that here. Here. Do some of that, wipe some of it away. But it, it's got that semi-translucency to it. So it lets our other stuff show through. I can wipe some of that away. So now hopefully the metal parts have a little bit more believability to them with this weathering. It also maybe gets those to stand out from the rocks. I'm going to do a few little streaks in there. But it can it can be too much in a hurry there also, so I have to make sure not to go wild with it. Now I might go back in here and here yeah, let's get some of the skin color back out here. This is the same skin color that we used again on our commander figure here. But in this case, I want to try and get a few parts of this rope. Not all of it. So 
So this is something that I have to do a lot of on brushes where you just have this, have this extra hair. Just kind of try and snip that away and see what that does. It can be a little nerve-wracking doing that for obvious reasons. Yeah, just a little bit of this here and there. And there's nothing that says, just like I said, in all of the army painting lessons, there's nothing that says you can't paint on your army for a while, take it to a certain level, maybe even just first stage, maybe mid-second stage, whatever. You play your game. Then you put it back on your miniature holders or whatever that you paint with, and then you paint some more. And, and this way, you get to play some games with your army. Maybe you, you see you might want to make some changes to it or whatever, add a unit. Because what I see an awful lot of, it's another reason why I try to do those army painting series. Because I know way too many folks that either just quit on a project or give up on painting in general, which is even worse. Because they just they get bored with a project. Because there's always, well, ambitious plans. We all have grand plans for an army. I want to do this. I want to have free hand. I want to have marble bases and all this other kind of stuff. And then the reality sets in and you say, my goodness, is this ever going to be done in my lifetime? And the more you start to question if it's ever going to be done, you're just going to be that much less inclined to want to work on it. And it starts to sit there on the shelf just kind of mocking you. Or it's packed away in a case somewhere and it just never is brought out again. And that none of those are good things. And that's why in the army painting episodes that I do, I will actually time certain effects and say, okay, it took this long. Is it worth it to do this a million times? Oh, thanks, Sandy. Much appreciated. I'm just glad that my voice has lasted this long. I was real worried that I would get to a certain portion of this and then the voice would just say, nope, no more. So this is kind of fun, just dancing around between some ropes here. so much different than what we did in those early stages where we were working more on, on just the crew and the the faces and such. I will say these war machines, it's not always easy to paint them like this where they're all together, but it does, I've had to do the alternative of assembling giant metal war machines and that's that's no fun either so here we're gonna go back in with a little bit of this bluish gray here even gonna take a little bit of that skin color there hopefully you can see that ah oh, good you can essentially what I'm trying to do here is actually put some scratches on this So it's, it's doing a couple of different things. We're getting some lights there, but also, again, maybe some sort of scratches where maybe the that oxidization is sort of scratched away. But I'm going to, this is going to be some of that maggot white again. Just going to throw this out here. 
I'm also going to get some more water in the wet palette here. I don't know if you can see. We're just adding some right there. I'm going to add some over here. Again, it's just a homemade wet palette Chinese food container. A chamois sponge. And some parchment paper. That's all it takes. It is not some 30 dollar ensemble or anything like that. And I have to say that I left it the entire time. We're at ReaperCon. So basically I left it untouched for two weeks. Actually, the some of the paint inside was still wet. There was no smell. There was no nothing growing in there. Nothing green. So I kind of highly recommend that for people that don't have one. Well, heck, I was going to say, well, if you just want to try it out. I don't know. I'm, I will never be buying myself a wet palette. Now that I know how to make these. So now we're just starting to add some of those lightest highlights to certain parts of the metal. The snow effects for this will definitely be the secret weapon crushed glass. Now I seem, as, as I look at the other one, I might have used to augment that. I might have used some of the Woodland Scenics Snow Flock. Although I probably won't be using that on here because, well, not quite sure what I, where I've got the Snow Flock, for one thing. But now you, we can see, see it's got the reds and the greens there. Yeah, let's do a little more highlight there. Now, I don't think I'll be able to do quite as much as in the way of snow and icicles on this as I did on that original stone thrower, not stone, the uh, scorpion. Just looking to get some of that reddishness there so here we go this is uh, I think you can see the icicles off the front of that and see on the spikes there that was that was really simple that was just the Liquitex heavy gloss gel it's the same stuff that I used to create water effects and it's even the same stuff I used to sculpt fire no kidding I use it for fire too now we got some gray, greenish gray. It's gonna go here into some of my skin tone. Now let's get ourselves some some kind of highlights in the hair. So again, that's the fire slayer. Flash a little more of that. Just mixed it in. Where's this hat? There it is. Just going to try and follow along with the hairline that's sculpted on him. And as, as I've said before, I don't necessarily want these to be too light. I'm even going to work some of that into the wood here. So we're, we're going to sneak in a little bit of wood grain and this is pretty fun too so I'm taking that basically a a red highlight color and I'm putting that over the top of green yeah right there so you can see how this starts to build up we start to get that nifty variety that we're looking for That's why I wanted you to think of this as, as a whole instead of just well, individual highlights on boards. This is another case where we just did some red highlights over some green. 
And I may do the, just the opposite in areas where there's more of a reddish mid-tone or dark. Oh, what the heck, let's do that. So here's some of that. Let's some of that green. We got it lightened with that same skin color there. And we got areas here that are more reddish. We'll throw some greenish highlights on those. Just like that. Just like that. And where you didn't have a whole lot of shape initially, you can see how it's all shifting. The reds and the greens in here. Yeah, it it took. I had to you know study some some reference of things and well we were just in the forest preserves over the the weekend there just kind of looked at wood that was on the ground wood on the trees and we just instinctively think brown and yeah it's in some ways it's almost your eye just telling you that it's brown when it's really there's way more going on than just that. All right, we're going to do some of that here, too. And a little more here. And let's definitely get a couple here. Now we've got, there's obviously the sculpted wood grain that's here. I'm also trying to well, I guess put in un unsculpted wood grain. Yeah, get a little bit of the rosy wood there. Let's do some of it over here. It is nice to, you know, be able to do something like this and know the thing's not going to snap off because it is really some rugged plastic. It's essentially, God, I don't know if it's really bones ish, but it's, it's like a high grade bones or, well, I would guess some of the more recent zombicide figures. But you also get the hard plastic that comes in too. So yeah, you can see how that spread out and created sort of the rusty effect there. Now let's get some of this, ironically enough, on the hands. A little more on the face there. Let's try and get some lights on the face here and I will just try and have one little highlight there let's let's get a little bit of the snake bite leather mixed with some of that light color see what I can do here with the here without making it too light. That man being a little bit on the light side might have to knock it down. We'll see. Yeah, I think I can get a couple of couple more here. Almost trying to do this as a bit of a ring here around the top of the head. Yeah, I think I need to lighten that up a touch. And let's go into this again 
Oh, looks like good. We still have some of this. Still at some of the blue there. So let's actually go in the opposite direction. We're we're making essentially a, like a bluish gray here. Oh, hey there. Three, three. Uh, actually, look at evil Elvis. Okay, yeah. Even I can read sometimes too. <laughs> not always, especially usually not that late. This is the brand new stone thrower here from Song of Ice and Fire. So there's the actual stone thrower with a loader. You've got some other guys here, another part of the crew with a stone, and then you have the commander figure here. This is the first thing that we worked on. You can always go back with all of these things and go back to the beginning and see what we did on those guys. So let's get a little more we have lots of mid-tones and lights here on these stones. I try and get some darks back into these. And here, this is what I'm going to target right down in here. Is some of these darks. It'll create a little bit more separation then with the strings. We're going to darken down some of these some of this metal bracing here that's the strapping. Those rocks over there those might actually um, I'm torn as to whether or not I'm going to throw snow on those. I could actually, yeah, but now they should remind me. I gotta get back to those guys, because I don't think we ever did their faces, or well, we never really did their eyes. But yeah, this is see what we're doing here, and this is basically a metal cover that we're using here to create some of that shading. Speaking of shading, we're gonna throw a little bit of that here on the stone. It's kind of a semi glaze. Oh, let's get some of that onto here too. We wipe away some of the excess. That's some of that drying retarder, which we found out doesn't really stop the drying, but it does make it a nice little, oh, basically a flow improver. So we're putting some of this into here too. Again, it's it grazed down some of that wood delicate balance because I don't want to gray the wood down so much that it starts to become the metal. Oh, let's see what I can do with the, this leather pouch here. See if I can get some separation on that too. Uh, mix a little bit of that. It's the same blue that I was using on the cloak here. Tunic, cloak, whatever it might be. Yeah, let's get some of those deeper rocks. That's actually metal there. That needs to be lighter. We've got an awful lot of dark and middle tone there. Not a lot of light. Let's see if we can do that. And I am going to actually just scumble this in. It falls into that same category of either wanting it to look like it's been scraped or just generally abused a lot. I'm thinking if that looks really, really flat or very smooth, that's some very gingerly treated you know, stone thrower right there. If we had just put a little bit of green into that, Actually, going to use my fingers here to blend some of that. Then back into some of the blue there. So that is essentially, essentially a glaze. And I know most people they tend to think of glazes as well. That's something that darkens stuff or tints stuff, but it can go beyond that. It really can. 
here I wanna try and get this edge to be a little bit lighter not absolutely everywhere but at least the uh, get a little separation there yeah same thing here because we've got so much shape everywhere else with this wood yeah that's more like it now we got some kind of separation going on there that was just there was nothing happening there as far as shape and we don't like that always want to make sure we have plenty of shape now let's lighten this up yeah that's just a it's effectively almost a glaze Now let's see if we can't find ourselves a couple of more lights here. Again, this is more of that warm highlight red. Oh, what the heck. Let's play with some greens on this guy too. So this is basically that contrast green mixed with some, some of our lighter colors there. Let's just play with some highlights on him, too. And if anything ever appears too light, obviously, because Night's Watch is supposed to all be, you know, taking the black, that whole thing, you just, you just glaze it down. That's all it is. Now I'm going to use some of that same green right in here. Sorry, I bumped the camera there. Working with wood and dirt, how do you differentiate the earth tones? Well, this is basically, boy, I don't know if you got to see it. So the kind of the undertones here are more of a red, and I'm actually putting more of a green highlight color over the red. Here, we put reddish highlights over a green middle tone, and that, it sounds crazy, but your eye doesn't really notice it. It sort of notices it, but it doesn't register it. Wait a minute. Somebody put green highlights. Like right here, we're actually taking this green highlight color, throwing that over some of the reddish stuff. Now here, almost got like a bluish gray, and this is more of a, basically a, almost like an orange highlight color that's going to go over the top of that. So you can see it, it varies here. You got almost like a pink next to a green. The day... Uh, your eye just sort of reads it a certain way. It's the eye really, <laughs> when you're an artist, it doesn't matter if it's doing 3D stuff or, or whatever, you're sort of the, well, I don't want to say you're a con artist, but you are sort of a sleight of hand. You're trying to make people believe what you want them to believe. So, oh, thanks, Sandy. Much appreciated. Yeah, I, I believe there are some folks that will set their kids down in, in front of the, the screen and they just use it to en entrance the kids. It's almost like they're being hypnotized, some kind of Jedi, some kind of Jedi thing. Uh, let's, speaking of this darker blue here, right in here, because see this is all too much the same. Let's get a little difference. Boom, right there. We're going to do the same over here. So that's a little bit more of a traditional style glaze. I think, too, so what some folks said is because there's not really the sounds of panic. It just it makes them think that they could also paint the same way, more of a panic-free mode. And I, there, there's times with any miniature that all well, things go sideways. And it can take many forms of things going sideways. Although I, I have now, well, let's see, Bob Ross, also MacGyver of miniature painting. That's that's come across. I think the latest is the uh, Chuck Norris of miniature painting, which I'll throw down that gauntlet there. Here, let's get some lights on these rocks over here. It's not a dry brush. There's 
plenty of paint on here using the same same stuff we were using over here if I go too nuts with these lights over here and let's say I do want to throw some s snow on top of these again if the rocks are lighter than the s snow color well that's gonna be some funky looking snow as that's gonna talk about the mine playing tricks or something there you're not tricking anybody's mind on that so that that is fairly here well I'm gonna set that aside now because we want to develop these guys a little more right here let's see if we can't do some more stuff with skin tones on these And, you know, I'm not quite sure. I don't think this guy actually has a beard. Even if he does, the heck with it. We're going to go, we're going to change change things up here a bit. So what I want to do is actually switch that more towards green. Like you do. Now, this is a little bit like what we did with the wood so we're make sure that's actually on camera for you there so this is some of my mid-tone red here gonna let some of that mix with the green so it's a little bit less like Santa Claus with a green beard we will let some of this also Get onto this guy, get some of it on their hands. And then, here, let's start to go over the top of this a bit. I'm just going to make sure that's on screen for you. Yeah, these, they've really done. And uh, Big Child Creatives, that's the company that's doing the, the sculpting on these. And they just... They continue to amaze me with what they're doing on these things. And they certainly make my life a whole bunch easier. And I always appreciate that. Now let's see if we can get some. There we go. Just looking to get some light colors in here for eyes and if sometimes it's got to be in a direction you can't see it I do apologize for that but such is life now he does looks like he has himself a mustache there so let's see if we can't paint some of that in so we'll give him that And then we can go back in and we can start to add some lights to it. And the, the tricky thing is you just have to be willing to let things not be look like they're complete for a much longer period of time than you're used to. You just have to say, well... That is not going to look anywhere near finished for a long time until all of a sudden, boom, it looks finished. I get the other reason for that too. To, to do that approach is how many of us get to just work on our projects for as long as we want? on a given day or a given week sometimes you just don't get to keep on painting on the same thing over and over again till it's done this makes it a little bit easier to start back up again because for some folks that can be a hard thing you know they've got the mojo everything's going great and then well just 
<laughs> as much as we'd like to stay up 24 hours a day and do this, we can't. So you have to stop, which means then you got to start back up again, which sounds so easy and is not always so easy. So here's some of that rosy coat. See if we can get some of that on, on his nose here. There we go. I want to get some. Yep, on the cheeks. It's just, it's really important to do that. If you want to relay that whole sense of coldness. Let's get a little more lights there on the face. So even on these, you have to see when you're willing to work back and forth. All of those really weird greens that we put down, well, now they're not so weird. They start to have context. Let's get some highlights on knuckles here. I just need to take a drink of something here real quick. One second. Ah, that's better because I've been talking for hours here. Now we're let's see what we can add as far as a light highlight now here. Just trying to get some final bright highlights on those knuckles but let's not forget we got hands over here I also have to start thinking about making this rock looking like the rock that's on the stone thrower itself but I won't do that just yet now I, I did drill holes in their feet and everything but just by the nature of the way these guys are, I'm going to get away with just gluing these on here let's see if I can sneak in some of this semi greenish right there little bit there so hopefully that's starting to look a little bit more like just a regular regular old face there I sneak a little bit of green into the hands here and then some highlights on the pants but then let's get this rock working here too Uh, I can see, okay, that's his fingers do wrap around underneath that. This is a little bit more round shape than what we have on the stone throw itself. Let's find ourselves a couple of highlights here. And let's get some of those same blue highlights. Yeah, I want to get some under here too. The top of the hood over here. Uh, it can sometimes be a challenge to reach all the mold lines, especially on guys like this now. It is possible to basically, for all intents and purposes, take these things apart and then put them back together again to, to get at some of the mold lines. But to me, it's just, it's not that critical. 
I'm going to try and get some highlights on his hair. And then actually that same highlight color now becomes a shading color on his mustache. This is what I mean by context. And it's right here on, on the same tiny areas of the face. But just a second ago was a highlight color becomes a shadow color somewhere else. So again, just look into a few few sneaky highlights here. Just to continue the hair texture. Let's definitely find ourselves some light areas down here. Once this goes on to the rest of the tray with the gun, or with the stone thrower, and the fourth crewman, we'll take another look at that and we'll see. As far as the mud goes, I have to take a different approach. Normally I would use oil paint mixed with weathering powders. I think I'm going to take a, a switch in that and maybe use acrylic paint and weathering powders together. So we're doing the same thing that we did on your commander figure. So what we're going to do is, see we got the dark in there. Now we go in basically sort of a reddish gray let's lighten that up a touch it's actually going to be a more on the greenish side here and make sure you can see now oh, I think you can see it bang right there see that starts to create more of a eyebrow there but you still got some shadow underneath the eyebrow. So they see just kind of look in a certain way. Now let's yeah looking for some highlights here. We will do the same on this rock. I need to get an edge right here, something to match what was done. Get on the, the one that's sitting on the stone thrower itself. A couple of quick highlights there. Now let's compare these guys. And so see we there we go. So they're pretty much working together there now. But once I glue these guys onto the the base there, it's gonna be really tough to mess around with them anymore. Especially as far as the faces and such. I'm really trying to get those locked in as much as I can now before I do that. And that was sort of a combination of the oxide paste, some sand and gravel, and the bulletin board cork. Now when you when you do sign up for that Army Painter Pledge Level, and it's basically the one that I recommend the most because it, it gets you everything. I send you an email. Well, once you sign up for that, that's the $15 a month thing. Is that scrolling across? Well, there's the blog right there. You can check that out too. There's hundreds, actually more like thousands of pictorial step-by-step -step tutorials there. Actually, including one on how I did the spikes and stuff on the other 
scorpion. But I send you, it's now, I believe, officially reached 200 hours of videos. The Army Painter series alone is 50 some odd episodes, especially now that we're about to start series 13. But there is every genre you can imagine. There's all the Dark Sword videos, single figure, large creatures, vehicles. I'm going to start doing some Mad Max start vehicles now for the Patreon page. We're going to start doing the War Cry stuff. I am prepping that now as we speak. Well, not exactly right now. I'm kind of painting right now. But earlier today, uh, Kathy was assembling some of the terrain because she's going to paint some of that on her stream. So it's going to be... And then hopefully we actually will be playing that with the miniatures that we painted. Because the whole idea of this is... As much as I love painting the figures... I also want to be able to play games and make battle reports. Now this is some parts here. You're just not going to be able to see what I'm doing. Because I'm trying to get an eye on this guy here. Just got to hold my breath a little bit there. Drop that in. Now let's see if I can't get an eye or a pupil here. Take some of the excess away. There's one. There's two. There's his. Her eyes on him. So let's let's see if we can maybe grab some glue here real quick. Let's see where we want to put these guys. So again, the commander figure, I wanted him round about here. So what I'm going to do is actually <laughs> I'm going to put some paint on his feet here. Put him, no, nope, I'm looking for a flat spot. Let's put him right there. And I'm trying to get this down to plastic basically here. Give him something to glue to. And the other foot basically is going to go here ish. And now I've got somewhere over here, hopefully, I got some sanding sticks. There's a sanding stick. And then we're going to get rid of some of this paint here. And primer. Again, see, I got my hole drilled right there. But I'm not going to, we're not going to use that. All right, let's, what the heck, we're going to pop these guys off too. I'm going to do the same thing here. I'm going to get rid of some of the paint that's sitting on here. Again, you can see the hole that was drilled there. So now we're basically back to some bare plastic. And I believe this is where I wanted them to be. Like they've just grabbed some rocks from here. And I'm going to do the same to actually here. I'm just going to say the heck with it and really dip it in some lighter colors here. And then put them right about there. We're going to do the same, same thing again here. 
Let's take some of this paint away. I could use an X-Acto knife or whatever. I just wanted to get down to some of the raw plastic surface here. Here, let's pick some more of this away. Doesn't really matter. <laughs> like I said, I can put that color back on. Alright, so here's some glue. This is actually some gel glue right here. Tend to like the gel glue. And hopefully this goes where we want it to and stays. Alright, so they're in position now. I just use paper clips. The biggest challenge is uh, matching paper clips to drill bits. Because, oh my gosh, there's like, the most minute difference between those two can really lead to some misadventures of pinning, that's for sure. Alright, so he's got his glue. And down he goes. So now, let's take a look at what it looks like. This is how it is out of the box. So you can see he's just kind of standing here next to these two guys. It, it's neat. Nothing wrong with that. But I just, I kind of like this arrangement a little better. Because now it really looks like they're actually taking this ammunition. They're going to do something with it. And it, to me, now there's more of a triangle. I like to compose things in triangles like that. So I am now going to go back. And I get some of my other brushes out of harm's way here. And get this one out of the way. And See, I've got ones that are more beat up. Like this one, so if some glue gets on that, I don't care. You can actually see some weathering powders that are on there. Speaking of which, weathering powders. Oh, let's see what we can find here. So we've got this one here. It's kind of a reddish brown. There's a secret weapon one that's got some more greenishness to it. And I know I've got one that's sort of a dark brown. Ah, this is the one I'm looking for. It's actually Secret Weapon has lots of different colors. But what I'm going to do now, see if I can't get a few of these colors out. Like so. I'm going to spread that out on the palette. And here, let's get some of this out here too a little bit of that and oh let's see we got some of this pro acrylic we got this dark umber I'm gonna put some of this out yeah he's got everything except his uh, the pearl handled uh, revolver there that's, that's uh, if I was mischievous on the other one I guess I could put that on there so let's take some of this. Here we get some water here. And you can see this becomes almost a little bit like a bit of a slurry right here. Now if I put too much water in there, it starts to get too thin. And the other thing I always keep in mind is this is going to be darker until it dries. Then when it dries, not darker anymore. So see how that's kind of a bit of a pile right there now let's see what we can do mud wise here now if it looks too much too samey uh, that's again another highly technical painting term we're gonna get in here maybe take some of the bluish gray I make myself a different mud color. Let's see how that's got some body to it. Look at that. 
Like I said, you can do this also with the oils. But look at that. We're going to get right over the boots there. So see how we can move this along. Look, we can put some of that on our wheels. It's another reason why I didn't go too crazy with highlighting that stuff because we kind of knew this was coming. Also the same reason why we didn't get too exotic with the shading on the base. Look at this. I mean that is a nice thick sludge right there. It's a big old pile of it. Here let's get that on his boots. And it just it has a this will have a bit of a oh what would you say really super matte texture also but look at that I mean it's just a big old chunk of mud right there I don't want to push it around too much because then I'll I'll lose lose the effect of it let's see it's gonna go over some of their boots here. Maybe even get some of it onto their legs. Again, onto the wheels. Onto this guy here. And if it's not green enough, well, I've got green paint. So now we've now we actually have some like greenish red mud here. Which I know that sounds weird. Greenish red mud. What does that mean? That means it's 3.30 in the morning here. Probably that's the best definition of what it means. Yeah, look at that. There's a whole bunch of different mud colors. Whoops, sorry, that's starting to wander off screen. Look at this. I'm just got a nice big old blob of that right there. Can put that around my stakes. They can see now some of the rocks there. And you can also see how this starts to lighten up. So the reason why I want all these different colors working. Now you can do the spatter thing too. That's always kind of neat. I think I'll maybe not quite do the spatter here because ah, I just I need more free hands just to put it mildly. There we go. So there's just there's so many different ways of doing the mud stuff. This is just one of several ways that I've done it. This is more out of I guess necessity than anything else. I can even get a little mud down in between the stones here. But you can see how that's see how it starts to lighten up and the texture that's already there is starting to take advantage of some of that. Well, let's see. Yeah, you wanna what is that you wanna lift with your legs and not with your back? So hopefully those guys have been lifting the stones in a very ergonomic way. Let's get a little bit of mud on the cloak there. Now you can see why I didn't go too crazy painting the back of his cloak because, well, it's sort of starting to be hidden by the war machine itself. So I did not really have a chance to look at this very much at all. I mean, outside of earlier today, basically maybe 12 hours ago, I had just started filing this thing. And now, about 12 hours later, we're just about to get our snow on there. Now, that's not to say I wouldn't go back in here and do some more stuff to it. Here, let's get some of that red mud back again. And look at that nice big old chunk of it. Here, let's just get a big blob of that right there. But you have to be ready for it to get lighter. That is 
That can be the tricky thing with the mud. Well, with the weathering powders, anyway. Is that they always dry so much lighter than you expect. Now, I also have to think I got snow that's going to be coming. Sorry, I just got to get another drink here. Okay, I think I'm going to want some, maybe some lighter mud in some places here. So again, I'm actually just mixing the paint colors together with the mud at this point. And I know it looks all the same, but when this stuff starts to dry, you will have a big difference. And what the heck, we're even going to add some Almost some white to that. The idea is to almost make it look like, you know, if there's different color mud, it's where their footprints are fresher. If it's lighter, I don't know if it's lighter, that's, uh, that's where the mud is dried. If it's darker, that's where it's fresher. But that's pretty well settled now. So mud effects, not necessarily completely done, but they're mostly in place. What I am going to do is get some of this paint out of the way here. And now we, we do need our palette still, but let's start to play with some snow as we enter our final phase here. Now you, you can see the, the warning on that contains crushed glass. It's really more like little tiny balls. I think you can even see some of them there, little tiny balls of glass. As long as you be smart with this stuff, say I got a glove on here, if you don't blow on it and blow it all over the place, it's really not going to hurt you. I've used this stuff for years, hasn't done anything to me yet. Also notice this, see where it says do not shake. It says it in really small letters here, do not shake. But what's the first instinct when you grab a bottle is to shake it, to shake the heck out of it. So, yeah, you just don't want to do that. Now what we are going to do is we've got stuff like this, a lid of a butter dish here. So something like this makes a great thing for mixing your snow. You got a little channel right here, maybe for some water or whatever. But I'm going to move this. Good. Looks like both of them are on the pallet here. And you can see this is still drying. Still in the process of drying. What we are going to do is separate our water effects and our crushed glass. And I always say this is a hard lesson I learned. Mix less, not more. Mix a little bit, can always go back and add more. So I still got my brush here with my wet mud. So we're going to leave that off to the side. Going to get another brush here. This is what we're going to use for our snow. And I'm going to start up here by the right by my stakes and hopefully you can see this now see how you got the snow like this when you got it more water in there like I do that's the kind of that melted snow if we want snow and mud mixed together well what are we gonna want we're gonna want some more melted snow this is what the other snows just cannot do they cannot make this kind of look at that see how it's all kind of melted there it's very translucent see how I'm just sort of gently brushing that on and see how it's starting to almost mix with the mud a little bit this is again the difference between this type of snow and that more traditional more flake stuff the powder stuff whatever the heck it is but I just prefer this 
because it's way more flexible. Now, let's say we do something like this. We start to add more of the snow effect in there. Look at that. See how it starts to take on a whole different meaning there? All right, I'm going to back this out. I just realized we're still in paint mode. Ah, that's better. Okay. Oh, it's no problem. <laughs> well, let's see. This, Yeah, this one started at an unusually early time at, what, 12-something o'clock? Because, well, I knew this was going to be so involved because I have been painting on this for over three hours now. And we still got more to go. So we're gonna we're gonna go back to our more wet snow here. Here, let's just keep going. Sorry, this keeps slipping off camera. So again, more of this muddy semi melted snow here. Like so. Here, let's get a little more of this over here by our commander. Now remember, I've got this on my wet palette. And now look at this. Look what's starting to happen. The mud and the snow mixed together. If you see some of my tutorials where the mud and I've got the blood effects on the snow, that's a little bit of what we're doing. So see how that just mixed together right there? Oh, thanks, Andy. Much appreciated. I use wall spackle to get melted snow, brush water. And, uh, it's, uh, well, that is, uh, I'm going to have to give that a try. Oh, you know where I really got to give that a try is on terrain because I got to make, well, pfft, I had to make winter terrain for Lord of the Rings, but especially for Song of Ice and Fire. So, Eva Elvis has just given me probably a fantastic solution for not spending a whole bunch of cashola on making semi-melted winter terrain. So that is much appreciated. So here we're doing the same thing. So I'm going to build on that layer. I'm going to push some of this over. Sometimes you need a couple of brushes. See, there we go. We got our melted snow, but that's a little more intact. Can even put a little bit of that. Let's scrape some of that on the tires here. Yeah. And I'm also going to scrape some of that onto the thing there. Now let's get a little more water effects out here. Oh, you can layer this stuff too. I wanted to mention that. Heck, you can even pour some of the crushed glass right out onto the water effects if you want. That's probably one of the least safe ways of messing around with this stuff. So I'm going to just dump that brush in my water here and clean that out a bit. Again, I do suggest you, you may want to have a glove on. So we're going we're to mix our snow here. Mixing up some fresh snow. Yeah, this, be, well, what is my favorite saying is nothing replicates nature better than nature. And what is snow but a whole bunch of tiny crystals? And what is crushed glass, but a whole bunch of tiny crystals. So see, a little bit of snow just got on there. I'm going to be honey badger, and I'm not going to care. Not going to care. And that's the more YouTube-friendly way of, I guess, expressing that. So here we are, just scraping this along the edge. Some wheels here. Back onto my stakes. It just has that transparent look. 
that only, well, little crystals can have. Now there are, ugh, I don't know who makes it. I don't know if it's Woodland Scenics, but they're these little tiny, more like foam spheres that I think might be a little less on the hazardous side. And I've, the name always escapes me. See how that's mixing together again with the... Here, let's get some more of my... So this is going to mix the mud. Wall spackle craft paint. Yeah, I've actually... <laughs> what I've been doing with the... Well, now it's more like regular plaster because I use it a lot with my here I need to get some mud over there because I'm using a lot with my my foam terrain is that I've actually been using wood glue as the instead of water well mostly wood glue still using some water but actually using an awful lot of wood glue so let's compare side by side so that's the oil paint and the water effects mixed together. This is basically more of a water-based everything right here. So once again, just going to rinse out this brush here so that we can do more of our glass. So we're going to move this back on the camera here. Now the snow over by the spikes, that is the stuff that's going to be a little more pristine. Here, let's get back into our snow here. Which means it's going to be a little bit thicker. You can see how that mixes very differently when you have more of the crystals in there and less of the water effects. I'm just going to, just trying to scrape some of this off here. And then you can push it around. Just scraping off the excess now, pushing that around. Let's get some underneath the war machine here. Scrape some on the top. I can even use another brush here squeegee some of that out of there now we've got ourselves a nice little chunk here snow you can see how much whiter that is and that's going to really give us a whole different look there. Here, let's just pile some of this up in here. And now we can push it around. And all of a sudden our stakes start to look a little more grounded. This can be a bit of a an acquired skill, let's put it this way. I've been using this stuff for years. And it really started to come into its own once I started needing it for all of this Song of Ice and Fire stuff. I've learned how to sculpt with it a little bit more like this. I didn't realize how much you can manipulate it. Now the the key thing is, you've got to make sure you don't have too much out here, and you work in smaller batches, which can also, it can be a little annoying that you can't work as fast as you want, but it's either that or have a whole bunch of, well, a big chunk of glass instead of snow. There, let's mix this together. Put some more of our snow out here. Because when I first started doing this, it was way more chunky. 
and it didn't quite have the smooth sculpted look that I wanted. I just I had to practice with it, kind of like anything else. You got to practice. So again, there's your softer, more powdery snow. Here, let's just get some of that down into here under the war machine. Again, sorry, these pallets are kind of wandering around a bit. Oh, there, we'll fill that in real nice. Now these, I'm probably not going to do the icicle things on these, at least not this time around. You know, a little more of the crushed glass out there. And again, we got ourselves a nice little mix here. Nice, soft, pillowy snow. Here's another nice one right here. And let's see, we can just, we can manipulate this. We can fade it out. Now remember, I still got to get some snow onto the actual crew yet. Air. So we're gonna get out some more of the realistic water here. And then some more snow or crushed glass. This time I'm just going to drop it right in there. Right in here. So I'm just going to grab what just fell onto the war machine there. I'm going to throw out some crushed glass over here because it is also possible to do something like this. So I just added some crushed glass over there. Let's see. Eva Elvis uses a spatula to apply fluffy snow. Yeah, it is. It's a lot like, well, basically a lot like sculpting. And that's what I feel like I'm doing every time I use this stuff now. It feels like it's sculpting. So see how we're layering this now? Because the initial layer was all very... All very moist. Look at now, we're starting to add some of the drier stuff on top. Just have to think of it in terms of layers, and I know it's not the easiest thing to do. And it's tempting to just want it to be all there at once. Okay, let's make sure we get this down in between the stones here. Let's just get a little, a little of the snow on top of it there. And under it there. As far as curing time, that's going to be different depending on, well, I guess the, the humidity and such where you are. The, the usual things with drying times on paint and plaster. So there's one nice big puffy blob. And I want to make sure that that gets down underneath the stake there. Now 
Now, what I am going to do is start to put a little bit of the snow crystals on them here. See that? Just a little touch of that and maybe even here on their their legs. But see there a couple of some snow up there. Same thing on this guy. It's not a lot. If I go too crazy with it, it's going to sort of overwhelm the painting. Don't want to do that. So again, some little bit of some kind of muddy snow on their boots. And now some snow here. Kind of caught up in the fur of his cloak. Some more here. This can be more of a challenge to make it stick just because it's a smaller surface. But look at what that does. Gives it a whole nother texture right there. Now let's work in some more sort of semi-muddy snow over here. Just like we did elsewhere. But what I want to do is get some of that chunky snow now. See if I can get some of this. There we go. Because I want some of that over here now. This is where we're, we're doing that layering thing. See like what we did over here. Doing the same thing on this side now. This is just an extra dimension, too. I like to always say I want a foreground, a middle ground, and a background. So our painting, our initial painting on this was the background. The, the mud effects were the middle ground, and now the snow is the foreground. But we're even creating some foreground effects in our snow, too. Because you know, we put that first layer on, it was all real wet and watery and mixed with mud but now we're starting to get to those fluffier layers of snow and again that's from secret weapon miniatures here we go let's grab some of this and now this stuff out on the edges here gets to be much fluffier So it really looks like that snow has been altered. Now it's muddy and chewed up here, but then it starts to get a little more see, pure and icy out here. But it can be as crystalline as you want or as slushy as you want. Yeah, here I want this to be... I want some... A little bit of snow on the bottom of his robe right here. Maybe even a little more snow. I'll scrape some more of that onto this. Here, let's try and see all that snow that's fallen into here. So I can bring that stuff back out and use it. Oh, let's go here with it. You can see that I'm trying to sort of make it look again like it's been the snow has been tramped through here. So, a couple more doses of this. 
And I think the snow effects will be ready. Here, some more. I need some slushy snow underneath these two guys over here that are carrying the stone. But like I said, this is, is something that you'll get used to. You know, you practice with it. There. We needed some underneath them too. Here, let's get some more of the snow over here. Maybe a little bit more of it up against the wheels there. Maybe like they've been in place for more than two minutes. Let's get a little bit of this snow underneath him. There's some more slushy snow. We'll just add it by that wheel there. It kind of makes it look more grounded. Maybe a bit more if I can get some fluffier snow out of this. There we go. And you can see some of this earlier snow is that's pretty much hardened in place. That's why I say you don't necessarily have all day to work with this stuff. So if you're going to do it, you're going to do it fast. I, I need some more of my, my crystals out here. And a little bit of this goes a long way. So you really don't want to mix too much of it at once. That might be one of the first lessons that you learn working with this stuff is just how much you can get away with mixing at one any one time. So you're just going to get some more of the snow on their feet here. Get some more snow around there where they're walking. Like you do. So see it's all very all nice and choppy now. Let's see. I'm going to go one more round here. Some areas where I want to pile up some snow, I think, around the stakes. Go with that much. And hopefully that's going to be just enough to get the job done. I think it is. All right, right in here. Yeah, I want to get a little more piled up there. Yeah, something like that. Maybe just give it a little hint of snow up there. Who knows, maybe a little more on, on the wheels here. Now this is a little more along the lines of the melted snow. That slushy stuff. We'll go with some more. This is a little more fluffy now. I think we've got these rocks pretty well managed and covered there. See, I've got a gap here i got to fill in my snow. That's better. Here, 
let's just see. I like to just sort of scrape this along and see how it's depositing little crystals of snow along the way there. So I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to manage painting a war machine and a crew of four, plus do all this mud and snow effects all in one live session. This, this has been a heck of a challenge for me. Gotta say that. Hopefully it gives you some hope that you can, you know, do something like this in a reasonable amount of time yourself. But have it really give you a nice look. Alright, I'm going to go with a little more of the realistic water here. And see what I can... Literally scrape up here snow wise. Just wanted to get a little bit more right here. And like I said, you don't have to you know, have to use this stuff if you don't want to, or if it's not available where you are, you can use the more, was it, the Woodland Scenic style stuff, the Vallejo stuff, the Valhalla and Blizzard. I've used that. I even have some videos that I did for the Patreon page. But when I tried to, well, first of all, I couldn't do any slushy snow with it. And then when I tried to put the blood out effects on it, just like I said it would, it looked exactly like, ugh, I just, I hated the way it looked. It looked like red paint on top of white paint because that's basically what it was. That's all it was. Was red paint and white paint. I even tried putting some fluffy effects in there, with some snow flock from Woodland Scenics. It just, it didn't, just didn't like it. Now let's get the palette back here. So again, that's all my weathering powders right there, mixed with the acrylic paints. Let's see what we can mess around with here now that we've got. Here, let's get that out of the way. Now I've got an awful lot of weathering powders out here. I should probably just grab a new palette. But here, let's... Just going to try and... Get a few things finalized here. A few final darks. I'm going to go around my edge with that gray liner paint too. I'll start to make sure that I don't stick my finger on top of snow effects because it is not completely cured everywhere. So here, this again, you can see you got the mud and the snow on their legs. That is why I did not spend a whole lot of time fretting about that part. I do want to solidify that hairline there. in some separation between the rock and their hands. I realize some of this is, would have been easier to do when they were still just separate from the whole rest of the thing, but sometimes you can't see what you need to do until it's all together. Not everything is ideal. Gonna add a few touches of light to this hand, to this buckle here. These are the type of things now that I see them in, in context of where I wanted them to be. Oh, let's see, well, I use a sealer 
if I seal these at all, it's going to be with the Army Painter Anti-Shine so that I can actually brush it on exactly where I want it to go. Because I definitely... Uh, where is it? Here we go. So that is the stuff. Because I can just brush it on exactly where it needs to go. I don't have to worry about weather changes or anything stupid like that where it turns crazy. What is that? Uh, oh, uh, a ghost? No, no, like a snow effect. <laughs> now that's ironic. Yeah, you don't want this turning into snow. That would be not good type of snow. So since he is kind of front and center, that's why we're trying to get a few extra little... Just trying to find a few extra little highlights here and there. Something like that I don't like. I just wipe it away. Now let's keep going here. It works really well. I, we we use it on Blood Bowl figures or well stuff like this where you're really going to handle it a lot. It makes a whole bunch of sense because on those areas of the figure, you know, place where you're, you're it's going to get more contact with the base or whatever because you're taking them in and out of the trays or Blood Bowl figures where they're going to be basically face down. This way, if I want to put ten layers like on the top of his head or here, the places that stick out the most, I can do that. When you spray it, you just, well, you never quite know where the heck it's going to go. To me, it's just kind of a disaster waiting to happen, really. I'm going to get some more of this out here. Again, I've got to watch out where my weathering powders are on this palette. I really, if I had time, if this is just me doing this on my own, I would have obviously switched the palettes around. But we've been at this for a while. And I didn't really want to make this last longer, just me switching out a palette. I like it. Like I say, you can go back and forth here. Start to find some highlights on this now that I know where he is in relation to this. I also want to get, there we go, a few. Some highlights on his face. There we are. Maybe even a couple of highlights on the fur. Not back here, but over here, I think, where they are more pertinent. Let's tone that down some. Yeah. going to see if I can... Again, it's more difficult with, with these guys being stuck on here, but sometimes that's just how it goes. All right, uh, let's call that completed there. Well, you see we got some nice separation here, not just light versus dark, but we also have that the gray versus the yellow right next to each other, that bluish gray. We got some opposites working. Let's see if I can get a few highlights on this chain mechanism here.
So like I said, if you want to see more, think well, like the special basing episode that I'm going to do on how I make the stakes on these type of little mini dioramas like this. It's all part of the Patreon page. That's the that's the basing pledge that I have. But the Army Painter Pledge level, that'll get you absolutely everything. You'll never miss a single video that way. And you get yourself a whole bunch of con content. And this, now, see, I'm just trying to find a few little highlights here along this belt line. Let's see if I can do one right here. And if it ever goes in a direction I don't like, I'm going to take me some green, mix it with the, that's the contrast paint there, mix it with a little bit of the red liner. And just problem solved. Now it's, I need to get some bit of a highlight on this belt right here. Good enough. This belt. Good enough. Looking to do that on the hand, maybe some on the hair. I see I need to actually go opposite here. I need to reinforce the darker line in here. And I'm going to say that is we'll call that completed because it is definitely late here let's grab the card that goes with it so there you have it there's your stone thrower for the night's watch we've got our crew of four and we took it from essentially this just plastic things on plastic to something a little more special like this, a little more of a diorama, something maybe that hopefully even tells a little more of a story, especially with the way our snow is. We did all of our snow effects, mud effects, and everything. So thanks for Andy and Evil Elvis and First Last and Comitrion and a brief little appearance by Bethany there, Tyler. Go do his go to his thing there in, in uh San Diego. That's at the or is it the Rady Children's Hospital in San Diego and Al. Much appreciate you coming on. Oh hey Jack and Baz. Much appreciated. I'll catch you guys on the next one sometime later this week.